Denise Amber Lee was a 21-year-old mother of two living in South Florida when she was kidnapped from her home. Over the course of the next six hours, five separate 911 calls were made, including remarkably one by Miss Lee herself when she was tied up in the back of her captor's green Camaro. And yet, on that call, she pleads for her life 17 times. And yet, no one could locate her. And ultimately, this was a story that ended in tragedy. Every day across the United States, 650,000 Americans call 911 facing some of the most challenging circumstances of their lives. Most of those calls transverse an infrastructure dating back to the 1960s and 1970s that accommodates almost no data. Indeed, the information flow into most 911 networks is limited to 512 bytes of data. To put that in perspective, this blank screen behind me has over 30,000 bytes of data. The first transatlantic cable in 1858 between the Queen of England and President Buchanan had 617 bytes of data. It is amazing in 2017 the technology that we carry around in our pockets today. Precise location, real-time health and medical data, voice, texting, videos, all these capabilities, except when our life is on the line. And then almost every single one of them gets turned off and we move back in time 150 years. The FCC estimates if we could just get more precise location over better infrastructure, we could save over 10,000 lives a year. Now, it is remarkable how well 911 works today in light of this infrastructure. And it truly is a testament of the extraordinary people that have dedicated their lives towards helping us in our times of greatest need. Working 12-hour shifts despite dated infrastructure, infrastructure lack of funding, old technology, they successfully manage over 240 million emergencies every single year. Four years ago, I would become one of those emergencies, walking home late one night in Spanish Harlem. In that moment, I realized just how difficult it can be to get out your cell phone, dial a number, and have a coherent conversation about where you're located, what's occurring, and the help that you need. At the time, I was working in venture capital, so I thought, this is a challenge that technology can solve. So I headed off to Harvard University for grad school to work on that challenge. In Cambridge, I met Nick Horlick, who was completing his PhD in nuclear engineering at MIT, and had had some similar experiences as me. So over an orange juice at Dunkin' Donuts, we put out a plan on how we were gonna solve this challenge. We were two naive computer nerds. <laughs> and it was with that naive optimism that I headed out to my first 911 dispatch center in rural Massachusetts. And that day would forever change how I thought about this challenge. I was listening in on my second call when this mother called hysterical. Her son had just committed suicide, and as she screamed for an ambulance, I had to take off my headset and walk outside into the calm spring morning. As I collected myself, that 911 call taker stayed on the phone with that mother for the next 12 minutes as she successfully figured out her location, dispatched an ambulance, and stayed on the phone until it arrived. This is not like any other challenge. This is the most intense experience that most of us will ever experience in our lives. Repeat it 650,000 times a day. I remember driving home and calling up my dad and saying, I need to borrow your Prius for the entire summer because I need to go meet as many 911 centers as possible to actually understand this challenge. So that summer in grad school, I would drive over 3,500 miles, meeting with hundreds of 911 centers across the country. Again and again, this industry opened their arms and answered a thousand ignorant questions about how data flowed into their systems, how they managed these extremely intense moments down to precision. Each night, I'd call back Nick and repeat back, 
my findings. And working with a growing engineering team out of the Harvard Innovation Lab, we'd iterate on new technology, new architecture, and we'd bring it out to my next meetings for testing. Ultimately, we'd interact with over 4,000 first responders who would beta test this technology. And along the way, we learned just how complicated this system is that came together over the last 50 years. A system where you have over 6,000 different 911 centers running 25,000 different software systems, talking to 60,000 first responder agencies, over 5 million first responders in the United States. We learned we had to get data exactly in the right place at the right time, or else we could actually do more harm than good in the process. The end result, after four years, is this transformative platform where we can ultimately ingest data from any connected device and pass it directly into the hands of 911 and first responders. Wearables powered by this technology now transmit real-time health and medical data during a heart attack. Connected cars in a crash transmit their precise location, how many people are in the vehicle, airbag deployments, rollover, velocity at impact. Schools equipped with this technology now stream real-time video during an active shooter event. One analysis we did with experts at Harvard and MIT estimated between one to seven minutes faster response time, a two to 10% reduction in mortality rates, over 10,000 potential lives saved every single year in the United States. But what became really interesting is not only how the data itself would impact each individual incident, but how at a macro scale, we could now start to understand patterns and trends in the data. Behind me is one snapshot of emergency calls through our platform during a few weeks in June of this year. The Department of Transportation estimates that over 90% of car accidents are preventable. We all know if it's snowing out that we're going to have more car accidents. But because historically we don't know exactly when and where those car accidents occur, we couldn't really statistically relate them to contributing factors like road conditions, weather, event data, traffic flow patterns. Working with a team of data scientists out of Harvard, we started to study this data and build predictive models and simulations. This is one example of Winter Storm Jonas and how we predict emergency calls would have came out during that event. So for the past 100 years, we've thought about emergencies in one way. They happen, and when they do, you call for help. You call your neighbor, you call the bucket brigade, you call 911. But thanks to an extraordinary community of people that have come together over the last four years, that paradigm is about to forever shift from a world of emergency response to one of prediction and preemption. Thank you.